Good afternoon. I am Carlton Smith, Education and Outreach Program Manager in the Fair Housing Project at the Legal Aid Society of Palm Beach County. We want to welcome you this afternoon to our Fair Housing Month event. Today, we will engage in a healthy discussion about Ayers property. Our featured speaker is Thomas W. Mitchell. Dr. Mitchell currently serves as Professor of Law at Boston College of Law. We will, he will guide us through the intricacies of Ayers property so we can gain a better understanding of the subject matter. Again, thank you for choosing to spend your afternoon with us for what we consider to be a very informative session. As we know, uh, for most of us anyway, April is Fair Housing Month. This year is the 55th anniversary of the passing of the Fair Housing Act. Um, and the theme for this year is Choices for All Voices, Building an Equitable Future. Here at Legal Aid, um, we try to adhere to uh, serving uh, our community and our constituents uh, in dealing with uh, helping them fight discriminatory issues in their uh, in their neighborhoods, and um, we follow the guidance of HUD and uh, other advocates out there. We follow their lead in this regard. In terms of fair housing, um, as we know, the law discriminates or prohibits discrimination in housing based on race, color, national origin, religion, sex, familial status, and disability. Additionally, here in Palm Beach County, uh, discrimination uh, is, is prohibited in uh, four additional protected classes, sexual orientation, age, gender identity and expression, and marital status. The Fair Housing Project at Legal Aid sponsors and participates in several events uh, during the month of April in an effort to bring awareness to fair housing issues that are prevalent in our communities. Today, we will address the issues associated with Ayers property. We encourage you to be attentive during today's discussion. We hope that you are able to glean useful information from the discussion so that you may apply it to address the specific needs of your community. Whether through training, education outreach, advocacy, investigation, or litigation, the Fair Housing Project at Legal Aid is uniquely qualified to fill the needs of Palm Beach County as well as the surrounding counties of Hendry, Okeechobee, Martin, and St. Lucie to eradicate all existing barriers to fair housing for all. A couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, again, this session is being recorded. Uh, during the presentation, we ask that you uh, mute your microphones and that, we, that you put any of your questions or all of your questions in the Q&A box or the chat box. Uh, we will try to address as many questions as time permits. Now let's meet our special guest. Thomas W. Mitchell, a MacArthur Genius Grant recipient, is working to reform laws and develop policy solutions to address the mechanisms by which Black and other disadvantaged American families have been deprived of their land, homes, and real estate wealth. Professor Mitchell served as the principal drafter of the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act of 2010. The UPHPA's three principal reforms, a co-owner buyout provision, guidance for courts to apply both economic and non-economic considerations in their deliberations about how to resolve a partition action, and an innovative sales procedure designed to produce prices approximating a property's fair market value will enable more families to avoid involuntary 
and predatory disposition of their real estate. Professor Mitchell is the lead co-editor and contributing author of a book, the American Bar Association entitled Heirs Property and the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act, Challenges, Solutions, and Historic Reform. With that, we present Professor Mitchell. Uh, so good afternoon. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna try to pull up my PowerPoint that I'll be using for this presentation. Uh, just one sec. Okay. Can everybody see the presentation? Yes. Okay. Great. So thank you for uh, to the Legal Aid Society of Palm Beach County for inviting me uh, during Fair Housing Month, uh, and thank you for the great work that um, the organization and many other organizations throughout the country have been doing to promote fair housing. As indicated, I'm going to talk today about heirs property. I'm going to uh, identify some of the challenges that that air about some solutions to some of the problems um, that uh, that I will raise, and I'll talk to you about the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act, um, which is an act that was given no chance of success when we started working on it, um, but we've had a, a pretty successful record, and I'll talk to you a little bit about um, what the act does, um, maybe some of the things that the act doesn't do, and some of the way forward in terms of additional kind of legal reform and policy solutions. So just, just overall, I wanted to kind of pan out um, just to not just focus on heirs property, but to talk about a variety of forced legal transfers that impact disadvantaged and um, property owners of color um, and it's important to know that when we're talking about uh, property owners of color, they're disproportionate. I'll identify five such involuntary transfers, foreclosures, um, adverse possession, tax sales, partition sales, and eminent domain. And one of the points just uh, that I want to make in terms of these various types of involuntary transfers is that they're often at the root is the disadvantaged status of the, uh, the property owner or some type of systemic discrimination. So in terms of foreclosure, um, one of the paradigmatic examples is what has happened to black farmers over the course of the last several decades. Many of them lost their farms due to foreclosure, but that foreclosure was catalyzed by systemic discrimination within the United States Department of Agriculture and the Farm Security Administration. Um, adverse possession um, is, is uh, and you have at least many rural African-American property owners I've talked to have indicated how uh, sometimes they, for example, have granted a uh, neighboring owner or uh, a group of folks who are hunting recreational, uh, recreationally to use their property um, under the understanding that they gave consent to that. But then sometimes that is that that access they have granted has been then used by those who claim that they can adversely possess and take ownership of that property. Uh, tax sales, and this is both in kind of urban and rural areas, have been a significant contributing force to the loss of black property in the urban and rural context. Once again, there's, um, there's a role that systemic discrimination has played in the prevalence of tax sales impacting um, black and brown people. And, One of the started to see some documentation of discriminatory tax appraisals where property owned by African Americans has tended to be assessed at an amount that exceeds its market value. 
uh, whereas sometimes property is owned by you know, middle and upper class white Americans in some instances has been underassessed. So clearly that overassessment has put some substantial pressure, economic pressure on those families. And sometimes those families just can't bear the burden. Um, obviously, I'm going to talk about partition sales uh, in the context of my overall talk on heirs property. Um, and so we'll talk about that in just a second. But kind of going back to my introductory slide, um, the point I wanted to make of having urban properties and more kind of um, rural properties is it impacts both. And then just in terms of eminent domain, and so the, at least in terms of how we train lawyers, the negative impact that eminent domain has had on black and brown communities was completely rendered invisible in terms of just how we teach law students. The, in almost every property textbook that first year property students use today, the case that is featured as representing the paradigmatic uh, case of eminent domain abuse is Kilo versus City of New London. So Kilo um, happened in the City of New London, which had been a chronically um, disadvantaged uh, municipality in Connecticut for years. And the property that is implicated in Kilo is a property owned by Suzette Kilo. So, uh, sometimes there's been movies made about it. It's, it's a little pink house. Um, but it's ironic that that case has been the case in that Suzette Kilo, a white woman, was paid three times the market value for her property when the city of New London used eminent domain. There are rarely uh, instances where you have properties owned by black and brown people where they even get what they're entitled to, uh, their constitutional rights to get fair market value when their property is taken. Um, and so when you're dealing with eminent domain, it's not just that uh, you know, African-Americans and Latinos have been disproportionately the, um, have suffered in terms of having their property taken. But in the majority of cases, uh, the properties implicated are black and, uh, are owned by uh, black and brown people, and those communities, those those, those owners, um, often are paid substantially less than the market value of their properties. So here's is the case from Southern California, the Bruce's Beach case which is the first case in the history of the United States where a black family that was wrongfully dispossessed of their property by some governmental entity actually got the property back. When the um, city of Manhattan Beach used eminent domain, uh, they used it as a pretext. They claimed they needed it for a public park. In fact, the public use um, or the public purpose was actually to get rid of a successful black family that was operating a successful resort. The Bruce's in the early 1920s were paid something like $20,000 for their property. Um, and it just has been appraised at $20 million. So you kind of get the idea that um, how much that eminent domain has contributed to the substantial uh, loss of uh, generational wealth among African-Americans. So let me just pan out all trends in uh, black farmland ownership and the black white um, home ownership gap. So in 1910, uh, it rep represented the high water mark for uh, agricultural land ownership among African Americans. Between the end of the Civil War and 1910, African Americans acquired at least 16 million acres of agricultural land. Um, and what can only be described as just heroic actions in the face of uh, you know, many of them making the transition from being considered property themselves as enslaved people to uh, becoming property owners. And oftentimes with not a lot of education, with not a lot of kind of infrastructure to help them in terms of legal services and. Uh, the lending institutions that would, would help them out. 
but we've now have had uh, massive amount of land loss in the last 120 years. So the current USDA data that I looked at is, shows that African Americans own about three and a half million acres of land. It's appropriate that it's um, you know Fair Housing Month, um, but there's something kind of sad about that. So if you look back to 1960 and you compare the black-white home ownership gap in 1960 to the data from uh, uh, 2021, I haven't uh, been able to update uh, or look at the recent data, just couldn't been busy. What's, what's, what's a little sad is despite 50 years or more of the uh, Fair Housing Act, the Federal Fair Housing Act um, being in existence, the black white home ownership rate today is greater than it was in 1960 when we still were operating under Jim Crow. I think the, the black 6% and it, based on this 2021 data, it had increased to 30%. The Fair Housing Act without question has helped there are other um, explanations for why it, the, the gap has increased. Um, you know, sometimes it is under enforcement of the FHA, but the, in addition, you, we just have developments today where real estate developers are, are developing many fewer you know, starter homes for people that would enable people to get onto the path of, of being homeowners. I am part of a, uh, a research team called the Land Loss and Reparations Project. Uh, one of the things that our team has been doing is doing an evaluation of black uh, farmland loss. So we just published a paper back in May that um, loss that black farm families have suffered in this period of 1920 to 1997 in terms of the loss of their uh, farmland. And our conservative estimate is that black families lost $326 billion of generational wealth um, when they lost their farmland. And so um, our team uh, published this paper, it was a short paper, um, in an American Economics Association publication at this time, we're working on a more fully elaborated uh, paper that also will talk about the significance of this loss of wealth, how it has negatively impacted econ economic mobility, neg neg negatively impacted the ability of Black families to finance their children's higher education um, and other such impacts. So one of the points I, you know, that I always want to make is that sometimes people will reduce the discussion about, about property loss um, among African Americans to just the economic impact. And clearly there has been a massive negative economic impact, right? So if you just look at our study, which simply looked at Black farmland loss in a 77 year period. Um, but that's just farmland. That doesn't take into account any properties that are not farmland, whether they're in the urban, suburban, or rural context. If the Bruce's family lost $20 million themselves, and that's just one family, um, it just has to be the case that, in terms of the Black community, that we've suffered trillions of dollars of generation of lost generational wealth over the course of the last several decades. When you look at all of the various of homes, loss of land, um, including the five I identified early on. And it's important to note that in addition to losing their property through various legal processes that, um, Black and brown people have lost their property often through extra legal um, actions, whether that was uh, physical intimidation and violence and lynchings um, or other types of extra legal uh, behavior, which is 
had a negative impact on these individual families. It's had a negative impact in stunting business and economic development. And then it's had a negative collater uh, collateral impact on other people, right? So, you know, if you look at the, from the Great Recession, uh, the uh, Black property owners that lost their property suffered a massive economic law in uh, neighborhoods where people who were didn't lose their homes saw the value of their property drop precipitously um, as kind of a collateral damage. But in addition to these economic uh, concerns, there are a number of vitally important non-economic factors. So some of this loss has contributed to erasing culture and history. Um, and one of the examples I give was about 20 years ago, um, I was in uh, South Carolina and I was, um, the, the people I was meeting with was from the Center for Heirs Property Pre Preservation in Charleston, um, introduced me to this one family that had lost the property in this community that was outside of, um, you know, within 30 minutes of Charleston. And this was this historic community, they call it the Phillips community. Um, so these, the, the Phillips community consisted of form, um, become emancipated. And then they ended up buying uh, part of the property of this former Phillips plantation. Um, that Phillips plantation, one of the original owners was a one of the original signatories to the Declaration of Independence. Um, but then you, some of the families within the Phillips community started losing their property as a result of forced partition sales. Um, and then you could see that in that neighborhood, the, um, the developments were uh, you know, radically different in terms of very large modern homes being built, contributing to the kind of the erasure of the, the importance of that that history of that community. And during the partition action, the court um, refused to consider the important role and the, the important history of that community in terms of the culture um, and history of that community. It's the erasure and it leads to cultural appropriation. So I actually grew up in San Francisco, California. Um, and part of my interest in kind of black land laws, black property laws, came as a result of what I witnessed growing up. I was born in 65. Um, and during my childhood, if uh, there was an area of town that uh, had a large number of um, African-Americans and we sometimes called it the Fillmore, sometimes called it the Western Edition. But what was certainly the case was if you ever heard of the Fillmore or the Western Edition in the media uh, when I was growing up, it was, always associated with um, dysfunction. Uh, you would, uh, be, there would be uh, media articles, uh, you know, television news reports about the crime, the pimps, the prostitutes, the drug dealing. Um, and that area of the city then was subject to urban and that it would greatly improve upon all of the deviancy and dysfunction that was um, apparently prevalent in the, in, the, in the Fillmore. What it ended up doing is it ended up driving out large numbers of African-Americans, whether they were residents or whether they were business people. And I was asked to give a talk at the University of San Francisco a couple of years ago, and uh, I think it was the history department and somebody had found out that I was originally from San Francisco. And they wanted to, uh, me to give a talk about, well, what was my experience growing up with the Fillmore? So I got out there a couple of days in advance and rented a car. I, mean, I still have some family out there, but one of the things I did is I drove up and down Fillmore Street. And I must say, I was like rather shocked when I discovered that the city of San Francisco now has is hanging these banners um, up and down Fillmore uh, Street. And basically, the Mars District. So one of the things I didn't know when I was growing up, I guess I was too young, was that in the 1940s, 1950s, up until the early 1960s, like shortly before I was born, that 
Fillmore Street in San Francisco had more black owned jazz clubs than anywhere west of Harlem in New York City. Um, and now that African Americans had been driven out of the Fillmore, the city now is using this history as marketing to uh, increase the number of tourists who might be interested in coming to San Francisco, um, which you know to me is just rank cultural appropriation. And then thirdly, um, and this is not a comprehensive list, but the loss of property, whether it's urban properties or rural properties, there is some evidence that it's had some substantial negative health um, and mental well-being impacts. So I just saw report that um, a number of black farmers who've been driven out of um, their farm operations express severe mental health issues, including, um, you know, issues of, you know, potential suicide. If you look at the um, Willa and um, Bruce and her husband, within five years of losing their resort in Manhattan Beach, after they experienced substantial kind of negative economic mobility and they died in poverty. Um, she had a mental health breakdown and died within five years. And then the year later, her husband died. So, and, and they're not the only people who have suffered these uh, kind of negative health and, um, and mental well-being challenges. Okay, so let me then transition into just talking specifically about heirs' property. So heirs' property, when I started work on this 25 years ago, though I came to find, find out that within the community's impact, I did this practicing lawyers and legal academics. It was a term that wasn't familiar at all. And folks didn't know. So I think the first time I found out about heirs property was about 25 years ago when I was in North Carolina and meeting with a group of um, black farmers um, in relationship to the Pigford versus Glickman suit against the USDA. Um, and the, during the coffee breaks, uh, somebody told the farmers that, oh, there's this lawyer. I was at University of Wisconsin at that time. There's this lawyer from Wisconsin. And, and so then the family started coming and telling me about their problems with, with heirs' property. Initially, I, I didn't know what they were talking about. I, just, I said, are you talking about air rights? Um, and no, then they spelled it for me and, and you know, ended up discovering that there was this substantial property with heirs' property that was, um, what I say, it was kind of, it went under the radar screen in terms of law professors give you, no, or no, I'm sure. So there are multiple problems with heirs' property. So heirs' property typically is property that is transferred from one generation to another, almost always because there was an absence of a will or an estate plan. So it's property passed by intestate succession and per the uh, state statutes, the state statute will define who the heirs are. Hence, why these communities began to refer to it as heirs property because it was so prevalent in their communities. So you have the problem of unstable and insecure ownership. So the, there's a few reasons that heirs' property is particularly unstable. My work focused on this law of partition, um, which governs uh, an ability of somebody to exit a common uh, property ownership structure. The tenancy consensually with the other owners, how they will exit. The, the law of partition, when I started working on this, um, easily enabled just one of the common owners. Um, often that was a third party who bought out some family member's interest, and typically the interest was a very small fractional interest, like 2 or 3%, um, and then turned right around and then filed a so-called partition lawsuit where they requested the court to order the remedy of a forced sale. And courts, beginning several decades ago, began routinely ordering these sales, even for rural properties that easily could have been divided up. So under the state statutes, 
the um, the preferred remedy was supposed to be the physical division, the partition in kind, as we call it, if that could be done, and then the property should only be ordered so divide the property and then allocate parts of the property to various um, of the common owners. A second problem with heirs property ownership is what I've uh, come to call gridlocked ownership. So if you um, want to do something in terms of using your heirs property that rises to the level of being some substantial use, or if you want to make some substantial change to the management of the heirs property, in every state in this country, um, the requirement is that you get unanimous agreement among all of the common owners. Problem with, uh, I mean, that's a problem if you're dealing with, you know, eight owners to get unanimous agreement. It's compounded with heirs property because this property often is passed down through multiple generations. At each time it gets passed down, the a kind of intestate succession as compared to having some type of will or other kind of state plan is that under intestacy, the ownership group tends to multiply. And so now you're not dealing with eight people. You're, you could be dealing with 25 people. You could be dealing with 50 people. You could be doing, dealing with 250 people or even north of that. And the chance that you're going to get 100% agreement that every single person who has a fractional interest, a co-tenant or an heir, is going to agree is going to be practically impossible. You could be dealing with the family member who's your third cousin who doesn't, you know, if the property's in the South, but that cousin is on the West side of Chicago or in Los Angeles, you don't even know that person. And so you have no ability to locate them, um, but the law requires that they agree. So as, as a practical matter, what it does is it renders the ability to use um, and then for those families who have discovered that what you know heirs property is the, the broader structure is called tenancy and common ownership. But tenancy and common ownership under the default rules, the rules the state gives you, which governs heirs property, is about the worst form of common real property ownership that the law recognizes in the US, in the United States. Some of these families because there's been a lot of attention to heirs property in the last seven to 10 years, discover that. They actually are able to meet with a lawyer and they say, well, we wanna, uh, we wanna get a different form of ownership, whether that's something called a tenancy in common agreement or some type of LLC or a partnership. And then they find out that as a practical matter, they're stuck in this most disfavored form of common real property ownership, but because they can't get a hunt, because they can't locate some people, or maybe there's some strife in the family and somebody just refuses to agree. Third problem is the problem of heirs property owners lacking clear title. Sometimes in the urban context, that's referred to as tangled title. Um, and if you lack clear title to property, it renders the owners ineligible for a broad swath of uh, potential benefits, whether that's getting using the property as collateral for a commercial loan from a commercial lender, or the ability of those families who have a uh, tangled title or a lack of clear title to participate in a broad range of governmental programs from the local, county, state, and federal level Oftentimes programs are specifically designed to help people maintain their ownership, uh, keep their property up in a habitable and, uh, and a, and a good, essentially rendered ineligible for programs that otherwise are designed to help the very type of people that they are. And then there's um, a kind of a lesser known problem of heirs property is that there are some property laws that are designed uh, to make property ownership more affordable um, and to increase the ability of people to maintain their property. So one of the great examples of this is the homestead exemption for 
uh, somebody's principal place of residence. But throughout this country, the homestead exemption laws are written in ways that as a practical matter, do not enable heirs who are the owners and occupiers of the property to be able to claim the homestead exemption, which in areas that are experiencing a rapid appreciation of real estate values makes the ability property, uh, it places it at great risk. So I lived in Dallas, I uh, was until recently for six years, and I visited a community in South Dallas, um, and you had a you had a home there that was that, that had been owned by this family since like the 1950s, but it was declining in value. They didn't have the money to kind of you know to paint it and, and keep it um, you know keep it up to to snuff. But they were because they were not eligible to claim the homestead exemption. Their property taxes were like nine thousand dollars. But if they had been able to claim the homestead exemption, their property taxes would have been about $1,500. So you can see over time that that's just going to present a challenge in terms of maintaining ownership of the property. There are, there are a subset of heirs property owners who are particularly vulnerable. So I list these kind of these vulnerable um, as families who are uh, otherwise kind of low income or low wealth. Sometimes we refer to these families as being property rich and cash poor. Their heirs property is by far their largest asset, but besides that, they have limited wealth or limited income. These families tend to lack access to a affordable legal services um, in terms of that could help them in terms of um, taking advantage of various programs that could make their properties uh, less costly, more affordable, uh, that could help them structure their legal ownership of their property in ways that make far more rational sense. You also have uh, the owners most impacted have low rates of will making or estate planning. And then the kicker is that these properties that once were not considered prime real estate are located in areas where there is an intense Sometimes you're dealing with uh, properties that are being newly developed. So think about the context of urban sprawl, where the property that's in question is a farm property, but it's right on the edge of a growing uh, municipal area. Or within the urban context, or the suburban, or the rural, you're dealing with gentrification. There is a racial element to this. Be, you know, obviously, we know um, that there are you know, numerous racial gaps in our country in education and in incarceration and access to health care. Uh, and I can go on and on, and I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know. But one of the, the, the least well-known racial gaps we have in this country is the massive gap in estate planning and will making. So I became familiar with um, a study by three economists a few years ago. I knew the one of the economists was at Washington University in St. Louis. And this, this was the way is that, is that you know, there's a, a substantial overall gap in will making was about a 40% gap uh, between you know, uh, black families, and white families. One of the things that's true in the study is that for every race or ethnicity, not surprisingly, the rates of will making go up with the more education the individual or the family has. So that's not surprising. That's true with every group. What was a little shocking in the study, and I know there's a lot of numbers here, is that for white Americans in this study, the lowest rates of will making were among white Americans who did not have a high school degree. Not surprising in, in that. But the rate of will making for that group was 57%. In their study, the highest rate of will making for African Americans was African Americans who had at least a college degree or a college degree and a professional degree or some type of other graduate degree. Not surprising that for making, but it is kind of shocking though in the study is that that weight rate of will making was 32%. So in other words, 
the African Americans, the demographic who has the highest rate of will making, their rate of will making was 25% less than the lowest rate of will makings among white American families, those who had no high school degree. And so, you know, maybe in the QA, we can talk a little bit about why that is the case and maybe what are some potential solutions. So when I started working on heirs property issues in the late 90s, there was very little academic scholarship about heirs property. As I indicated, it wasn't even a recognized term. You had uh, a very limited number of media articles, some that if, if there, the, the few that existed talked about black farm family properties um, as a result of partition law. And there had been almost no um, effort among elected officials and policymakers to address any of the negative impacts of heirs property ownership and, and the law of partition. But one of the things that has contributed to some of the success that I'll talk about in a second, the incredibly unexpected success of this Uniform Act or model state statute that I uh, was the principal drafter for, was that we had uncovered the fact that um, the problem with partition law and heirs property, though disproportionately impacting African-Americans, impacted families of many races and ethnicities, and that it was not confined to um, Black families with respect to their, their farm properties in the rural South. Families, whether their property was located in rural, suburban, or urban communities. And so this slide just gives you a little bit of a sense of the various communities uh, impacted. Um, whether we're dealing with families in North Philadelphia or families in Eastern Kentucky or on the Texas-Mexico border or in Hawaii or in the among Black families in the rural South. So let me talk a little bit about, I know this was highlighted in the introduction for me about, about this Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act, right? Um, it, it has a number of bells and whistles, but there are three key features that I know that was talked, I'll just try to talk about it, uh, elaborate upon it a little bit. So the first provision is what we call the buyout provision. So this kicks in if one of the um, tenants in common decides the court to order the remedy of the forced sale. What the buyout provision enables the other co-tenants who want to maintain ownership of the property to do is buy out the fractional share of the co-tenant who is seeking the forced sale of the property. And so oftentimes the family will be able to work collectively to buy out that share of the person seeking the sale who could own like a 2% share with a, uh, a value of $25,000 for their share. Right, so that's that's the first thing that the, the uh, that the act does. The second thing is that despite the fact that the overwhelming number of state partition statutes have always said that the partition in kind, or sometimes called the partition by division, the physical division of the property and the allocation of various parcels to the various go decades ago came up with what I call the economics only test um, to decide whether to sell the property or whether to order it sold. And because the state statutes were not, gave this weak preference, it didn't, um, the, the statutes would only say that the physical division um, was preferred unless it would result in something called substantial prejudice. But the statute didn't define what substantial prejudice was. So these courts stepped in and said, that if the property, if the fair market value of the property is worth more than the fair market value of the different parcels that would result from a partition in kind, then theoretically selling the property would, would lead to this economic benefit to these families. 
And so that's how they justified selling it. It turns out that that was a mythical benefit because the court, when they were fair market value of the entire property, which was completely wrong because the sale procedures under every state that govern how the property is sold predictably doesn't produce a fair market value price and oftentimes produces a fire sale price where the property is sold for just a fraction of its value. So not only uh, did the families lose their property, but they didn't realize this mythical economic benefit that the courts were um, predicting that they would receive. And then the third thing is the, the, what the act does recognize is that there's a subset of partition actions where the appropriate remedy probably will be the forced sale. So once again, tenancy in common property, heirs property often exists in an urban context with a family home. If you have 40 tenants in common or 40 heirs, there's no way you're gonna physically be able to divide the home. So what our renovation for sale would be the, the um, make the most sense. But we also agreed that we should try to vindicate the goal of maximizing wealth. But we knew that this sales procedure every state had wasn't accomplishing that purpose. So we uh, developed what we call the open market sales. The sales procedure that's designed to mimic a sale between properties that are not being forcibly sold, that where they're sold between a willing seller and a willing buyer. And so under the forced, uh, under the open market sale, as opposed to a uh, court ordering an auction that will happen at the courthouse within 10 to 20 days of the court ordering it sold, where there's no opportunity to inspect the property, where the um, bids that are made typically can't be made contingent on financing, and, and where that um, the winning bid has to be paid in cash the day of the sale. The underpoint, a real estate broker, a licensed real estate broker, who has to list the property for its fair market value appraisal. There's no artificial time limit on when they have to sell the property. And prospective bidders um, can make a bid or can um, yeah, should make a bid subject to getting financing, contingent on their ability to get financing. So predictably, you're going to have a substantially larger sales price um, under the open market sales procedure than under these auctions. So let me just kind of take you where we are nationally. So when I started this work, I wrote, uh, I published an article in the Northwestern University Law Review back in 2001, uh, where I laid out many of the problems of kind of heirs property and the partition, um, our partition actions. And then I proposed some remedies at that time. At that time, the universal consensus among law professors that your, um, your ideas for reform will get you nowhere. There won't be a single state. And the assumption was that heirs property owners who are disproportionately people of color, who lacked kind of economic and political power, simply would not be able to convince legislatures to change partition law. And they had some empirical data. There were several attempts beginning in the early 70s in a number of Southern states to reform partition law. And unfortunately, they all met the graveyard. So that, you know, so they, when folks talked to me, they said, you know, what makes you think that you're gonna have any different result? Um, we can talk about some of the dynamics maybe in the Q&A that led to that different result. But you know, here's where we're at today. So I just kind of gave you a smattering of selected states in the top left. That was South Carolina, then Governor Nikki Haley. The reason and she had, um, it's kind of a bittersweet story. Um, one of the reasons that the South Carolina back in 2017 enacted the UPHPA in the law was that uh, state senator and pastor Clemente Pinckney who was the pastor in Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston when he was murdered, uh, along with um, you know several of uh, his parishioners. Um, he, in the South Carolina legislature, he had been the biggest proponent of reforms 
to property laws um, impacting heirs, property owners. And so in South Carolina, the, uh, the act was named after Clemente Pinckney. Um, you know, the lower picture on the left is uh, this governor signing it in Missouri. Uh, and obviously you can see that that's the Florida Capitol. Uh, New York uh, signed it into law, I think is 2020. And on the uh, picture on the right, right Virginia, uh, you guys get extra points if you can identify the person standing behind him. I'll tell you it's Ralph Sampson, the former, the former basketball player. Um, I include that because the governor actually invited me to that signing, but it was in the height of COVID pre-vaccine and my wife has um, any number of health issues. And uh, so I wasn't, I, I couldn't go to Virginia for that signing. But let me just see if this pulls up. I'm gonna to try to pull up a map of where we, where the UPHPA has been enacted into law and this works. Slow, so I'm, I'm going to talk, and maybe it'll actually pop up. Um, so, as of two weeks ago, um, we have now 23 states that have enacted the UPHPA into law. In every region, but one of the things that you know is kind of exciting to me is that the um, area that had ex uh, experienced total failure in terms of reforming partition law is now leading the country in terms of the number of enactments, and that's the South. So I think we, when we got Maryland last summer, I think we now have nine or 10 Southern states. And, um, you know, so there's fewer states left in the South where it hasn't been enacted. Um, and I think, you know, this term, you know, we have at least a 50-50 chance in North Carolina. We'll see where we get. We have a bill in, uh, in Kentucky as well. Um, but, you know, at least we've gone from having no chance in, uh, in North Carolina, for example, to now having a pretty good chance. Okay. Okay, so, so that's, that's the UPHPA. As I indicated, uh, there's this other problem with gridlocked ownership. And based on the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act, the organization that promulgated, which is, is the Uniform Law Commission that's existed since 1892, was established by the ABA in 1892. When I talk to most audiences, their eyes get glazy when I mention the Uniform Law Commission. But when I mentioned the Uniform Commercial Code, at least if I'm talking to lawyers, everybody's heard of that. And so I remind them that that's the, it was the Uniform Law Commission that promulgated the Uniform Commercial Code. So... They came to me a couple of years ago after the unexpected success of the UPHPA, which today, uh, if you, it's now the most successful uniform real property act that the Uniform Law Commission is, has promulgated in the last 30 years. And they said, you know, hey, Thomas, do you have an idea for a second act? And I talked to them about this problem of, of gridlocked ownership. And then a couple of years ago, they approved the formation of a drafting committee to draft a uniform act that would try to address some of the concerns of gridlock. So the act will be finalized in the next, uh, make it easier for tenants in common to agree to use the property in some significant way or to change the management of the property in some, set, some substantial way. Um, and that pertains to you know, selling, mortgaging, or other matters of alienation. It implicates changing the ownership structure um, so families can get out of this dysfunctional tenancy and common ownership under the default rules. It does so in a way that it does retain the requirement that 100% of the owners who are, you can ascertain, they have to agree to whatever is the proposed substantial use or management matter. But it would eliminate the requirement to get consent from the co-tenants who are unknown unlocatable or otherwise unascertained. Um, so at least on the margins, it should help families be able to use their property for some hybrid agreement to one that's much more stable and much better allocates rights and responsibilities. I thought just because 
y'all are in Florida, I just, uh, this is not a comprehensive list, but um, these are some organizations that are working with heirs, property owners, um, and I'm, you know, sure in, uh, that maybe your organization is working with heirs, property owners as well. So this is not representative of all. I uh, gave a, a lecture at the University of Florida in Gainesville back in April, and uh, some these were some of the organizations represented there. Okay, so I, I did want to talk a little bit about this problem of so-called tangled title that is sometimes most mostly a title and mostly a terminology used in some urban centers. So the problem with tangled title often is this problem of the lack of these families having clear title to their property, and there's been some. Some estimate places in this country that, has, that have tried to estimate the lost economic value of lacking clear title to your property. Um, so I know that there was an Alabama study of a few Alabama counties uh, uh, several years ago, and it uh, the uh, amount of lost economic value was when it was a couple hundred million dollars in Dallas County in Texas last year. So not just Dallas, but the county. There was a study that showed that the lost economic value from not having clear title to the property was something like $1.1 billion. And the city of Philadelphia just commissioned a study with the Pew Research. Um, and similarly, the, the lost economic value from lacking clear title was north of a billion dollars um, and mostly in North Philadelphia. But in addition to these, economic problems of, of this tangled title. There's a number of health, safety, and crime impact. Your title, like having tangled title, often contributes to blight in uh, certain uh, neighborhoods or, or areas of the city. In places like Philadelphia, where you have row houses and you have sometimes those who have tangled title ultimately abandon their property and they become fire hazards and they don't just then contribute to um, you know, uh, causing damage to their that row house, but it often spreads to neighboring row houses. And in this Pew study that uh, the city of Philadelphia commissioned, it showed that in areas of the city that had a high incidence of families who lacked clear title, they mapped onto areas of high crime and gun violence as well. So there's there's just this is just going to be. Um, talking about some resources or some developments in the last few years to try to help um, families who lack clear titles. So the 2000 under what they call their relending program, where families can get low interest loans to engage an attorney to A, help them create an estate plan where they don't have it and help them change their form of ownership to, uh, to a, a much more rational, much more stable form of ownership. A couple of years ago, uh, FEMA revised their disaster assistance regulations where heirs property owners had often been rendered ineligible for disaster relief. Uh, and this has happened, happened in Hurricane Katrina, it happened in Puerto Rico. And now it, it there's uh, some of the increased flexibility is enabling heirs property owners to demonstrate their ownership in other ways besides just having a deed to the property. And then you've had in the last few years, a number of nonprofit and legal aid organizations that have taken a real interest in heirs property. Um, and so and I, and it seems like deciding to operate in the heirs property space, which has been a nice development. So this is just a, a few, let me just kind of summarize some. There is this 2018 Farm Bill. Um, maybe in the q and I can tell you how it's been used to uh, for us to get more enactments of the UPHPA. There is a law professor at the University of Texas that um, helped draft a statute that now will enable heirs property owners who own and occupy um, or heirs property as their principal residence to be able to claim the full homestead exception exemption. So uh, Texas still is the only state that has such a law, but hopefully it'll be a model for other states. I just had to give a talk actually out in Hawaii uh, in the last six to eight weeks. And I found out that not only did they enact into law the UPHPA, 
But if it is certain uh, kind of historical family land, they now uh, provide that can, with respect to that property, there has to be mediation. And also the, the state of Hawaii's, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs has to be included as a party um, to help these families who oftentimes lack affordable legal services. And when, after Virginia enacted the UPHPA into law, you know, three years ago or so, uh, it raised their awareness of problems of heirs' property. And, and the very next year, they passed a second statute in the context of helping heirs' property owners get greater notice when there's a tax sale of their property. We've seen a lot of, um, you know, compared to what the baseline was uh, several years ago, kind of a number of law schools and universities now are creating experiential learning and policy. We're going to, let me not overblow it. It's more than there was several years ago. And this, uh, the block on the bottom left just gives you an idea of some of the law schools that are developing clinical programs, other experiential learning programs are doing policy. work. There's this uh, you know, appropriations in terms of that 2018 farm bill, but uh, at the local level, the city of Philadelphia just allocated seven and a half million dollars to legal aid organizations to help families clear tangled title. Same thing in D.C. after they passed the UPHPA into law last summer. The mayor, who wasn't familiar with heirs' property, then included a million dollars in her budget to um, legal service organizations to help heirs' property owners. And then you have kind of a range of other um, you know, positive developments. I just found out that the National Consumer Law Center has made a decision to uh, prioritize doing heirs' property work when they really had done that before. And you have other organizations that are also stepping in. There's been a, a good development in terms of uh, at the local level. So the Philadelphia Registers of Wills and the Register of Deeds Office and San Antonio's Vacant Building Program have established at least pilot programs where they're helping the family. Okay, and then the last thing is, um, you know, in the introduction, we talked about this ABA book um, that was that the ABA published. Um, so it's not going to come up here on you know heirs' property in the Uniform Partition Heirs' Property Act. Um, I've actually heard from the ABA that they've had some really good sales of the book, and I want to make it clear, I have no financial um, incentive, I have no royalties, but it, it's proven to be a very helpful resource for those who are working to help heirs' property owners. There's talks about the Uniform Partition of Heirs' Property Act, there's the uh, there's chapters on the role that grassroots organizations played in helping develop the UPHPA and get it enacted into law. There's a section on this chapter that addresses a variety of alternative ownership structures or entity forms that uh, potentially, hopefully, heirs property owners will be able to avail themselves of. Um, there's, there's chapters on, on a state there. So, um, so I think now let me just, uh, let me stop. Let me thank you once again for having me be a invited guest speaker. Uh, and I'm now happy to answer any questions anybody has. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Um, very enlightening, very impressive presentation. Um, again, we thank you for being here today. Uh, we're gonna open up uh, for questions at this time. Please uh, enter your questions in the Q&A or the chat box. Well, Carlton, while we wait for the um, questions to come in for Dr. Mitchell, um, I did want to announce that Legal Aid Society of Palm Beach County is a recipient of a grant from the city of Rivera Beach to start our first heirs property project. And so that is, you'll be able to add our link to your next presentation that we are going to be launching our own um, uh, per preservation project to help heirs of property owners. We're going to start in Riviera Beach and hopefully we'll find other funding to grow it to other cities in Palm Beach County. But Riviera Beach will be our first target area and our first um, city that we're going to work with and working on helping heirs either do probate or help them with estate planning to make sure that we create opportunities for generational wealth in our community. So I'm very pleased to announce that. Yeah, that's awesome. I, when I started, like I said, in the late 90s, it, 
you know, among policymakers, among uh, a number of orders, it just wasn't a thing, right? There, there were a small number of organizations working in the trenches, but, um, you know, it, it really was something that was flying under the radar screen. I'm just uh, continually heartened to hear that there has been kind of an expansion of organizations working or governments or, you know, sometimes governments and nonprofit organizations or legal aid organizations. Uh, Uh, Carlson, the first questions in. Okay. How would we include this in planning documents when developing community plans? Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask somebody to maybe refine that a little bit, or at least let me know about what type of planning documents that um, that are being referenced. Okay, Ms. Simon, could you clarify your, your question? Could you be a little more specific? Urban planning documents such as our master plans, uh, if possible. Yeah, so I'm not... Um... So I'm just a plan. Um, it's actually the first time I've been asked this question. Um, well, it sounds like, you know, in, when, when our community development offices do their analysis of impediments of uh, fair housing choice or our, um, they do their five-year plans and turn into HUD. They have to kind of go through some of the challenges that are facing either affordable housing or housing in our communities. And, um, you know, this might be something that they could incorporate as an impediment to fair housing choice and a, an impediment to certain groups of individuals, because I think the data, as you've shown, how it impacts certain um, racial and ethnic minorities. And so that could be something that they start researching and incorporating in their analysis of impediments to fair housing choices, the impact um, that heirs property issues might have in creating home ownership opportunities for African Americans in our community. Yeah, I mean, certainly if you look at the Philadelphia example, as opposed to looking at the areas in North Philadelphia that are impacted, and just say that they're inevitably in decline and then making planning decisions based upon an assumption that they're negatively in decline. They've done an intervention to try to kind of shore up those, uh, those families who own heirs property, clear their title, enable them to kind of build wealth. And the idea is that that will have a kind of a multiplier effect in that community. So as opposed to just saying community inevitably has blighted and then you know, uh, proposing various actions that would then, um, you know, seek to, quote, eradicate the, the blight, but also maybe eradicate the people in that community, that, that by highlighting it as an impediment, but then also then having concrete ideas about how you could kind of stabilize and enhance that ownership um, might have a positive impact in terms of doing the like, master plan. Thank you, Ms. Simon, for your question. Are there any other questions, comments? Please put them in the box. So one of the, so I mean, we'll see if there's any other questions. I mean, one of the things I'm often asked is, um, you know, given that there was this consensus that you could not change partition law because those who were most impacted fundamentally lacked power. Like, how has that happened? Like, um, how did the unexpected actually happen? So I'm not saying somebody has to ask me that question, but if anybody wants to talk about that, I'd be happy to address that. Dr. Mitchell, I know you, you uh, mentioned, you might want to elaborate on the uh, farm bill yeah. legislation, uh, I guess, 2018. Mm -hmm. You seem uh, a little excited to talk about that, to get into that a little bit. 
give us a little more explanation about that. Yeah, so I think that there was, I think the question it looks like from Sammy as often, I think that's kind of what I was getting at into my response about the master plan and the comprehensive planning about how it could be, um, what, what you have in terms of what the Philadelphia Register of Wills is doing, the Philadelphia Register of Deeds, the San Antonio has in their historic preservation office, they have this vacant buildings program. Um, so they've been uh, doing all they can to work with heirs property owners to clear their title, to do things like community legal education workshops to uh, help the families better understand what the law is governing their ownership. Um, and then in some other places, this is you have a variety of, there's a program called the Sustainable uh, Forestry and African American Land Retention Program where they're, they're taking folks who have various property, trying to resolve some of their legal issues, including clear title. And then once that title is, is, is cleared, these families then are eligible to for various like USDA uh, programs, um, and the, it's property that had some substantial forestry potential. So now it's 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 changing an, an asset that, that the families were experiencing as a liability because it was generating income, and now it's generating income. Um, so that's kind of in the rural context. So, but it's the same idea of properties that were um, that were not. Uh, producing any economic value for the families um, that were seen as kind of lost causes and then having a variety of interventions that then can have those um, properties themselves be revitalized and help revitalize. Thank you, Sammy, for that question. So I'll talk about that. Yeah, I'll talk about that, the aspect of the, one of the ways that we've been successful is and how it relates to the 2018 Farm Bill. You know, so we've had, oh, you know, the, the first time that any state can enact the UPHPA into law was 2011. Um, and over the course of the last 12 years, you know, we've even getting one or two was exceeded what anybody thought was possible. But we, we kind of hit these various stages where we thought we had maxed out and then something happened and it opened new pathways for us to potential new enactments. So Florida actually is an example of that. Um, so as a direct result of the 2018 Farm Bill, we ended up being able to put certain states in play that we had like zero chance. So what the 2018 Farm Bill says in relationship to the Uniform Partition Act, And references the Uniform Partition of Various Property Act. And it says that if farmers and ranchers um, in your state who own heirs property, if they are in a state that has enacted the Uniform Partition of Various Property Act, those heirs property owners are eligible for some expanded uh, program participation from certain USDA programs as compared to farmers and ranchers who own heirs properties in other states that have not enacted the UPHPA into law. And as a direct result, we ended up being able to get states that, you know, literally we had no chance. Um, so we got, for certain reasons, we had no chance in Illinois before the 2018 Farm Bill. We had no chance in Mississippi before the 2018 Farm Bill. We had no chance in uh, Virginia before the 2018 full Farm Bill. And we certainly 18 Farm Bill. Um, in fact, the largest section of the Florida Bar, the Real Property Probate and Trust Law section, took a preemptive strike against us in 2019, published an article in the Florida Bar Journal that claimed that, uh, among other things, that the UPHPA was, quote unquote, a solution in search of a problem that partition law in the state of Florida throughout the state was uniformly working in a wonderful way. So there was no problem. Um, and they took several other shots at us thinking that they had killed any chance that we would ever get an introduction. And they were quite surprised to find out when we got an introduction the very next year. Um, and it was the farm bill that provided us that opening and among other people, I went to Tallahassee and spent a day at the Capitol talking to various state senators and representatives. 
And they were very interested in talking once they heard about the farm bill. Same thing in North Carolina. Uh, North Carolina, the Speaker of the North Carolina House for years, who was a real estate lawyer who did lots of partition actions, uh, you know, basically refused to, to let us take it up. Um, but he retired last year, and even though he's still lobbying against us, we, we have a bill now in North Carolina that I think we have a 50-50 chance. So I think that that provision, those provisions of the Farm Bill um, have, have been very important. Um, while I'm talking about it, I see another question. It says, has there been any amendments to the proposed legislation, legislation that significantly impairs the law? Um, so what I'll say is that is, is we've been lucky so far that we um, that we've been able to resist any pressure to dilute the, the Uniform Act itself. Um, and then in certain states, uh, we have had an effort in a couple of states to either or to get rid of it, even though it's already been enacted. It's only been a couple of states where we've been fighting that battle, um, but so far we've been prevailing. Um, you know, although I'm going to continue to monitor those couple of states to to make sure that um, that the UPHPA is on firm ground there. But not only has it have we been able to kind of fight back against efforts to dilute it or amend it? Um, we've, it's in, in three states now in the District of Columbia, they actually were so enamored with the UPHPA, which only applies to family owned, you know, heirs property and not to tenancy and common properties overall. Cause there's many tenancy and common properties that are commercial properties. There's many tenancy in common properties that are not owned by family members, and the UPHPA does not apply to those. But in three states now, Virginia, Maryland, and just um, last summer, California, got a California PHPA, and then made it the general partition law. Um, so we've, we've had increasing success in actually expanding the reach of the UPHPA. Are there any other questions? Yeah, if there's no questions, let me just kind of quickly, like, um, you know, in addition to the farm bill, let me just quickly kind of give a thumbnail sketch of, you know, how we've been able to defy all the odds. So when the UPH, when, when there were initial advocates for partition law in several Southern states, it, it almost always was, framed as a racial justice matter impacting predominantly African-American owners of, uh, of farmland. And the, you know, you typically had civil rights lawyers working with members. Um, unfortunately, that strategy didn't work. Um, it, it got racialized. And so one of the things that I learned in, as I was in the three years we spent drafting the act, um, I, you know, I realized that if it was going to be framed that way, we were going to fail. We probably would not even have gotten the Uniform Law Commission to promulgate it because there started being concerns that this was a, you know, statute only dealing with black people and um, and into in the you know since 1892 the Uniform Law Commission has had. Uh, you know, about 425 people serve in the role that I served in. I am just one of five people of color ever to serve in that role. And at the time, I was only the second African-American to serve in that role. Um, and so, so people were referring to it as the Black Act by the Black principal drafter. And that was not good news for us. And so I then in the... Uh, is... I reframed it as an issue that uh, impacts families of every race and ethnicity and families, whether they're in urban, suburban, or rural communities. You know, sometimes I'd say African-Americans have been disproportionately impacted, but they're not the majority of people who own heirs property, which is actually accurate. Um, and then, you know, so this, this happened to be an issue and this, not all issues that are racial issues can be reframed in this way. 
Um, but it surprisingly happened to be an issue that was amenable to being reframed. And then, you know, when I do my legal advocacy work at the legislative level, I'm, I'm, I'm an advocate like any attorney, but part of it is understanding your audience. My audience is state members of the legislature. So in every state that I've looked at, I study who is on the relevant committees, if it's going to be in the Judiciary Committee or what. Whatever the committee is going to increase the likelihood of your success, right? So not only do I universalize it, then I basically frame it as it's, it's an act that is primarily concerned about increasing property rights for property owners and maintaining the family's uh, generational real estate wealth. And that pitch in certain places um, has gotten surprising success. Now, I will say that when I testified in the District of Columbia, California, there was a different set of legislators <laughs> who had different priorities, right? So we have a racial justice message and, um, you know, but it's, it's been knowing how to tailor the message, how to frame it. And then as opposed to the initial attempts to reform partition law between 1970 and 2010, we built um, a coalition that was both bottom up. So we have a lot of the organizations that have worked in the trenches on um, dealing with kind of heirs property, whether that's the Federation of Southern Cooperatives or the Land Loft Rancher Project, um, the Center for Heirs Property Preservation in South Carolina. But we also were able to get, you know, two sections of the ABA have endorsed this, the premier organization for real estate lawyers in this country, the American College of Real Estate Lawyers endorsed it. We ended up getting, uh, as a result of the farm bill, some state farm bureaus that were on our side. And then a couple of years ago, the, um, it started with a former student of mine um, when I was a longtime law professor at University of Wisconsin. I had a student of mine, a former student of mine reached out to me, and it turns out that she was working with the California Association of Realtors. And then she said, listen, I just want to let you know that in California, the, the realtors are going to champion your act. And we had some other opposition in California where we had no chance of camping it. And then I found out she gave me an introduction to the National Association of Realtors. And what they basically told me was that it's about three years ago, the National Association of Realtors came out with a public apology for everything they had done in their history to promote segregation in housing. And they asserted that they were going to turn the page on that and be different. But they said, we understand if you're skeptical, given our history, but we are going to try to take tangible action to promote fair housing, to promote property rights for disadvantaged families and communities. And then they stumbled across the UPHPA and they said, that's totally consistent with the message. And so my former student, not only did we prevail in California through the introduction she gave to me to the National Association of Realtors, we've now had in a number of states, the State Realtors Association is now uh, part of our coalitions, um, including in North Carolina, that's helping turn the tide for us there. Um, so, it, so it is that, that are grassroots and grass tops that is uh, kind of working hand in hand that has uh, proven especially helpful. Well, again, thank you so much, Dr. Mitchell, for being with us. Thank you for that awesome presentation today. Um, such a, a wealth of information. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, close out the uh, webinar. I'd like to thank our host, uh, our, excuse me, our uh, sponsor, which is the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, we'd also like to thank uh, the Legal Aid uh, Fair Housing staff for their tireless effort to go out, educate, and protect uh, members in our community um, against uh, housing discrimination. Uh, but most importantly, we'd like to thank you for joining us, again, taking time out of your afternoon to spend time with us. We, we hope that you have received uh, Again, it's a wealth of information that you can take back 
and use in your efforts to uh, address these issues in your communities. Okay. Uh, thanks again. And we hope to see you in the future at another uh, legal aid event. Thank you. Okay, thank you again. Um, and maybe I'll, after this, I'll, I'll just send that link to the ABA book, um, which yes, is proven, yeah, it's proven to be a great, and I don't know if you can push it out to the people who attended today or not, um, but, but 